Yeah, yeah, should be going now. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. So, welcome to the Iron Age. We've made it um, through the previous two epics of history, the the, uh, the, the two uh, other preceding periods in the three age system of history, which is widely accepted as the uh, the general way to to categorize this 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 overall great span of human development um, is uh, first you have the the Stone Age, which we talked about very briefly when we first started doing these webinars. And then we moved on to the Bronze Age, which we uh, talked about uh, some of the conflicts and empires and proto empires that were evolving in the Middle East uh, and parts of Northern Africa uh, and China. And what we're what we're transitioning to today is the Iron Age, which is a period in history uh, categorized by technology, the use of the use of iron tools and weapons, and iron working and carbon steel. Now. Uh, before we really hop into the nuts and bolts of it, what I was saying right before we, we started the recording is there's the Iron Age is, is interesting because, uh, well, I mean, a, a lot of er eras of history are obviously interesting for different reasons, but the Iron Age in particular is interesting because it's a period of enormous transition. And there are uh, two, well, there's several approaches in, in teaching and sharing information with people about the Iron Age uh, from a historical and a historiographic perspective. Um, but the, the method I prefer is to look at iron, the Iron Age at, on a regional level where we look at different, different regions, different uh, places in the world as we've done it in the past with other epics in, of time. And we, we look at their individual transition from one period in, uh, of history to the other um, because really trying to cast a, a wide net or a wide blanket over all, all of humanity and say that you know this is the transition period where the Iron, Iron Age occurred, it, it doesn't do uh, academic or technical justice to it because it was at this point in history after the Bronze Age collapse that people were migrating to different areas. They began settling in different areas and they began taking on their own uh, ethnic and geographic uh, uh, characteristics that were distinct, that would become distinct facets of cultures uh, years down the road. So. Whereas one area of the world, like say uh, Britannia and uh, or the Celts, say they 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 may have entered the Iron Age proper and exited the Iron Age in a certain time frame, the Romans on the Italian uh, in in Italy, for instance, would have entered and exited at a different time. And what's specifically interesting about this is you you begin to see where these cultures that are entering and exiting the Iron Age at different periods of time, they begin. Uh, interacting with one another. And you see that the cultures that have access to iron technology and are more familiar with metalworking and the benefits of iron, they come to dominate neighboring cultures because of their technological, because of that technological advantage. So um, what I will go through briefly uh, a little further into the webinar is we're going to go down a regional timeline that will discuss when these individual uh, geographic regions entered and exited the Iron Age. Um, now, another interesting element of the Iron Age is we, we know we know with relative certainty when the Iron Age started. Uh, it it pretty much started for almost every major Mediterranean and Middle Eastern culture uh, during the late Bronze Age collapse, and that's when we talked about the Sea People. And there's a couple different theories between uh, uh, epidemics, uh, uh, trade collapse, um, foreign invaders. Uh, but regardless of who's right or who's wrong, um, we know from the historical record and archaeological evidence that the, the late Bronze Age collapse occurred in the 12th century BC, uh, around 1177. Mm. So there and, was, so yeah, that's key. I mean, you say there was a collapse. So yeah. there's like, I wouldn't I'm not necessarily say prosperity, but mm -hmm. it wasn't just yeah. like, hey, we discovered uh, iron and then now things are better. Like something. Yeah, because. Because usually when, when you bring up the term Dark Ages or Middle Ages, everyone immediately associates Dark Ages with medieval Europe, uh, which is true. I mean, that there, it was a dark period. But the Iron Age uh, itself, following the, the, the late Bronze Age collapse, this was, in essence, uh, the first Dark Ages. How long uh, did that last? Well, uh, it very, again, it varies regionally, but generally you're looking from about 1200 B.C. to 300 A.D. And the... Oh, it's the, a long time. <laughs> yeah, it's 
Well, it's a, it's a long time when when we when we start looking at the, the 300 AD region. That's when we we're looking at very specific cultures. Now, if we're just looking at the the, the Mediterranean and what we consider Western civilization, the Iron Age was much shorter because of. Oh, you were referring to the Iron Age. I'm sorry, I just meant yeah. to ask how long the collapsed Dark Age lasted. Oh well, the, the Iron the Iron Age in essence is is a Dark Age. Oh, it is a dark yeah, age. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there, I mean, there, there are advancements taking place, but when you compare it relatively, um, you have, you think that the Iron Age is a period. It's it's between. It's sandwiched between the the preceding age was the Bronze Age, and as we discussed, there was great strides forward in proto written languages. Mm-hmm. There was uh, elaborate trade networks. Uh, these cultures were waging these uh, enormous wars against one one another with these enormous armies. And mm-hmm. They uh, they created wonderful works of art, and there were these proto economies, these 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 new uh, economic uh, ideas that came up of, of related to trade. Agriculture exploded, and populations exploded, which allowed um, diversification and specialization of labor. So you then you begin getting artisans and, and um, tax collectors and bureaucrats, and and the Bronze Age was very sophisticated, more more so than a lot of people give initial credit for. Um, and then on the other side of the Iron Age, we have the Roman Empire and we have Greece, classic, cla- classical Greece. You know, we're, we're talking about classic antiquity, um, Aristotle, um, you know, um, and we're looking at um, Thucydides and um, um, Herodotus and all, mm-hmm. all of the all these these great scholars. And then we, we go to Rome. And of course, everyone's familiar, at least on the surface, with the Roman Empire and what they did for Western civilization. So. We have this uh, on either side. We have all these, all this sophistication, all these great leaps forward in in the the human condition in the mm-hmm. the, the evolution of humanity. But the Iron Age, although although the technology is there and they they and humanity adapted to a new form of technology, metalworking, it's relatively considered a dark age because mm-hmm. uh, there's uh, pretty much ceaseless warfare. There's not so much these enormous set piece battles where we could say that this this particular battle changed the the course of human development, but there there are just the constant violence and battles um, mm. because of the proliferation of iron, and that that's one of the things I wanted uh, to strike on in particular is iron working uh, had been around during the Bronze Age period, um, mm. but, but the difference is with uh, with bronze bronze is is a lot more difficult to gain access to because you need copper and tin to make bronze it's an alloy and tin in particular is very hard to find uh and it's it's not as common as iron but the the working with it is is much easier than iron because when you when you make bronze weapons and bronze tools they're cast in a mold and Mm. and the melting point of copper and tin is much lower than iron and, Mm. and steel alloys so initially, even though the resources were more difficult to find, bronze working was much simpler than iron working. With iron working, you have to produce a much more intense heat because mm. you're, you're literally, you know, we're, we're talking like blacksmiths now. They're, they're pounding the metal and they're manipulating it. So as opposed to having a, a cast item, you're having something that's hammered and worked. And they're basically the hammering of the metal over and over again is working out impurities called slag, which um, allows you to refine the iron and and have a more durable product and that was not that was not an entirely alien concept during the bronze age there there was iron work but the the technique and the materials needed to make effective iron age uh iron, iron weapons and iron tools were exceedingly rare in in the bronze age so that's that's why you don't hear much about it mm-hmm. um but the iron age in the iron age the the uh the, the technical know-how and the skills to work uh, more efficiently with iron became per, they, they were proliferated uh, around the world. Mm-hmm. So it's the Iron Age itself is not like one day someone just discovered iron and said this is superior to, to bronze. Let's you know let's start oh, okay. making, let, let's let's mix iron with something else and make steel. Um, it was the fact that what had previously been a very um, a very difficult task that was only known to a, a select few people. Uh, that those skills and that training began to diffuse across many cultures and many cultures started using iron. And when they started using iron, iron is much more common than zinc, or I'm sorry, iron is much more common than tin. Uh, so it was easier for them to take iron. And then <clears throat> as they had done the past with, with, uh, 
copper and um, tin, they began combining iron with different other metals. And when you do that, that's, that's, that's what leads to steel. And if you can get your, your fire, your bellows uh, hot enough when you're working with iron, the carbon from the, the coal or, or your source, uh, it, it uh, basically transfers to the metal that you're working. And that's what, when you hear the term uh, high carbon steel, uh, that's, that's very hard. That's, that's typically what they're talking about is the carbon that, uh, from the fire that's, that's heating the, the, the steel, the, those carbon atoms, that element mm -hmm. is transferred to the steel and it makes it harder. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, prior, but prior to this, this technology diffusing and prior to the people understanding how to better work with iron, iron really wasn't used that much because it, it, the, the initial um, attempts at working with iron during the Bronze Age and the Late Bronze Age they, they produce like really brittle products that weren't really good. And they're mostly used for like jewelry and ornate mm -hmm. things. But, mm -hmm. but essentially that, that's what happened is people began to understand how to manipulate iron better in its properties. And it, it ended up with a, they ended up with superior tools and equipment. And okay. the, the other interesting thing, as opposed to the bronze age, when um, nation or when, uh, when empires um, began working with bronze, it required highly trained artisans and it was a very coveted uh, practice. So you would see these, you know, only the, only the largest, most impressive armies with the greatest amount of wealth had access to this technology. And that, that's, that's why you had, you know, bronze weapons in the hands of the Egyptians and the Hittites who fought each other. Mm -hmm. um, but you didn't have these smaller satellite, you know, uh, entities and, 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 and people with access necessarily to a lot of, a lot, mm -hmm. a lot of bronze weapons in the iron age the technology just exploded and iron was so um available and so uh, plentiful that you you saw everyone had suddenly had access to iron weapons and mm. it wasn't just it wasn't just these large states or these large empires rather that that had iron weapons so what you end up with is a lot of uh, a lot of these actors a lot of these um uh, a lot of these upstarts, uh, these smaller entities with roving bands of marauders that mm. you know now, now have iron weapons, and that that's that's where the ceaseless warfare really comes from. It's not these enormous yeah. set piece battles between empires; rather, it's it's just constant violence and conflict. And yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so just let me clarify one thing, because um, before I thought I heard you say that it lasted until 300 AD, but then you referenced the advancements of the Greeks, and I was like, well, that was more. 300 yeah. BC. So yeah, I, and, and that's and that and that's that's the regional difference um, because the because the Greeks, for instance, they um, the the okay. the Aegean area they they uh, they exited the Iron Age more quickly than they they, oh, they exited. Okay. They exited the Iron Age long before 300 AD. You're oh, they right. exited exited yeah. the Iron Age. Well, what does that mean to exit the Iron Age? Like. Do they go into just like leaving weaponry behind or what, maybe something <laughs> well, else? Or? No, that, well, it doesn't necessarily mean they abandoned the use of iron weapons. I mean, to the mm -hmm. contrary, they, they continued using steel and iron, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for, for, for that we still use steel and iron today. Still use it. it. It's not a technology based thing. What, what really, um, the, the line of demarcation between uh, the Iron Age and classic antiquity around the Mediterranean uh -huh. area is where we actually see the emergence of the, histor the historiographic record. In other oh, okay. words, we're uh, people are still using iron, but we start to see uh, the written word really come to eminence okay. uh, in, in in cultures, and that's where we start to see the philosophers. So, when you yeah, refer back, you. when you refer back, and you think of uh, classical Greece, you know, and, and you think of you know Sparta, Athens, uh, all these great scholars and stuff, that's that's the age of classic antiquity. Uh -huh. uh, the period preceding that, right after the late Bronze, in between the late Bronze Age collapse and classic antiquity, is the Iron Age, and it's actually referred to uh, in Greece. They call it uh, Archaic Greece or uh, Dark Ages Greece. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what scholars that study the period call it. Because, and the reason they call it that is because there, there's there's no evidence of uh, written works during that time frame. Um, a lot of the evidence that we're looking at is based strictly on the archaeological record, uh, pottery, tools, and weapons, and things like that. And we see the found and in Greece in particular, that's where they start really laying the foundations and the groundwork for what will later become the, um, the pol uh, I believe the plural for it is the policies, the city states, such as Sparta and Athens. But, mm -hmm. but for that brief dark period, this Iron Age period in Greece, um, it was a very, it was a very dark and troubling time. And they were ruled by regional kings that fought one another constantly. Mm -hmm. 
And that's what actually led to people beginning to, you know, give serious thought to, well, we, you know, this unchecked warfare is savage, you know, and that, that's what led to the, the creation of democracy and our, our Western um, tradition of philosophy and the city state land owning, land owning, uh, land owning citizens mm-hmm. that have some sort of representation in their government. So out of this dark iron age, out of archaic Greece comes classic antiquity. And that's, mm-hmm. that's what we transition into it. So again, this, this period, um, which when I go to the regional timeline, you'll see it, it's, it's very, it's very brief um, for certain portions of Europe, uh, specifically central Europe and Southern Europe and the area around the Mediterranean. Uh, but for um, the, the extremes, as you get, as you get into harsher climates, uh, the, 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 you know, further North latitudes where it's cold and unforgiving, <clears throat> um, like in, um, uh, in Scandinavia, for instance, they remained in the iron age for a much longer period because after the bronze age collapse, the trade network collapsed and they didn't have access to any sort of sophisticated technology. Uh, so they, they were stuck with, uh, iron working substandard iron working and they really didn't make any great strides forward in literature or philosophy or government, and that's why that's why we we say they were in the Iron Age for much longer. And you see, like the you see the Celts in Britannia that were in in the Iron Age much longer than say the Romans who came along and they were still using iron weapons and steel weapons, but they began to create this sophisticated form of government, and they um, started using they started making use of these wonderful engineering marvels and. And, you know, uh, not surprisingly, they came to dominate the Mediterranean and parts of Africa and, and you know, most of Europe. So um, that's what we're really looking at here. That, and that, that's why I started off the, the entire conversation by saying the Iron Age is a it's a transitory period. It's a it's a period. It's a dark period of incredible transition. It lays a foundation mm-hmm. for a lot of other stuff. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, but with the History Channel um, article here. Thank you, History Channel. Um they basically just say the same thing that we were talking about right here. Uh, the Iron Age was a period of human history that followed the uh, Bronze and Stone Ages. Um, and it encompassed Europe, Asia, parts of Africa. And it says here it started between 1200 and 600 BC, depending on the region. Uh, and when, we, when we're looking at um, uh, the Mediterranean and the Middle East and most of Europe, we're referring to about 1200 BC because of the invasion of the sea peoples and the collapse, the Bron- late Bronze Age collapse. But as we go further east towards Southern Asia, the subcontinent, uh, parts of China, they were a bit more insulated from that late Bronze Age collapse. So they actually entered the Iron Age a bit later, which means they exited the Iron Age a bit later. Um, so again, that's why I wanna go over a regional timeline because it's very fluid and it, it varies incredibly per region. Um, and then they talk, uh, this, this article also hits on what we're talking about, um, smelted iron sporadically throughout the bronze age. So it's just important to emphasize again, that this is not necessarily iron's not this incredibly new thing that they just suddenly, someone suddenly discovered and then started passing the word iron working had been around for, for many centuries, uh, prior to the iron age actually beginning. It just wasn't as sophisticated or uh, proliferated as it was during the period. Um, <clears throat> uh, we see a lot of, um, uh, again, a lot of transition um, around 1200 BC, we see the collapse of the Hittite Empire and the, um, I believe it's the Assyrian Empire or, or the, the Assyrian states, uh, the, uh, there's small regional actors, not necessarily an empire yet, but they, they fill that vacuum and eventually form an empire. But um, especially around Anatolia um, and parts of what are modern day Turkey, um, the, the Fertile Crescent, what we talked about previously, Mesopotamia, that entire area is thrown in complete chaos. And really the only, the only enduring empire that survives the entire thing is in, in Northern Africa and Egypt. That's, that's why they can, um, they're so well known as they, they endured through the entire thing because Egypt under, I believe it was, hmm, I think it was, I think it was Ramses the third, might be the second. I'd have to look that one up. I believe it's the third though, but they actually repelled the sea people. They were the only civilization that supposedly repelled the sea people. And there is a, there is a, a a bit on the historical record um, stating that they were able to tame the sea people and that's why they endured uh, as an empire uh, during this dark, dark period. Um, what else do we want to look at here? And we're talking, again, talks about the archaeological evidence um, 
indicating the um, collapse, the late Bronze Age collapse and transition into uh, Iron Age technology. Now, this is why I made reference to earlier, the Greek Dark Ages. Uh, Greece became a major hub of activity and culture in the Mediterranean during the late Bronze Age. Mycenaean civilization, so Mycenae, Mycenae and Greece are the forerunners to what you would consider uh, Hella Greece or Helen Greece, the, the classic antiquity period of Greece. Uh, the Mycenaean civilization, they were very rich and became very wealthy during the late Bronze Age, but then there suddenly was this collapse uh, from you know what we talked about before, supposedly the sea people or plague or epidemic or natural disasters, we're not sure. But <clears throat> regardless of what caused the collapse, it caused a dramatic collapse in trade and Greece itself fell into a very dark period, which is called the Greek Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, so the um, Mycenaeans are a different people, a different civilization. Yeah, yes. Um, they are they're different because the Myce Mycenaeans are they're they're separated more or less by time. Eth ethnically, they're essentially the same people that we oh, see okay. in later Greece. Okay. But the reason we, we the reason we refer to them as, as Mycenaean Greece is because the classical Greece that we think of from, from classic antiquity encompasses a a larger area than Mycenaean My Mycenaean Greece did. Okay. Uh, and it it also had it's it's also such a different uh, place with the development of uh, democratic government and city states and um, just all the advancements that it's it's really in its own right a different culture. Uh, right. So, here. Yeah. So Mycenaean Greece was very similar, but Mycenaean Greece, for instance, did not have democracy and a representative government. Uh, okay. So things were run very differently. But and then you you also had during the late Bronze Age collapse, uh, or, or after, immediately following it, you had all these massive migrations, and, and Greece was not uh, exempted from that. So people were migrating, and of course, when people move around, they begin to, um, you know, they, they, uh, they I, what's the word I'm looking for? I guess they, they breed with one another, you know, and, and you, um, you begin having these different combinations of people. So um, the, ethnically, they, they were essentially the same people with a, a few differences here and there because different cultures came in contact with one another and they reproduced and pr produced a, a slightly different type of person. Okay, interesting. Um, and then Mycenaean Greece had, and this is the, this is why we refer to as the collapse in the Dark Ages because Mycenaean Greece during the Bronze Age had been a literate society and they were making strides towards, you know, what would eventually become classical Greece. But because of this collapse, the Iron, the Iron Age occurred and it was a very dark period no written records. Um, and the period in Greece lasted for three centuries, which, I, you know, is, is a long time. I mean, 300 years is quite a while to be living in a dark period. But relative to other parts of the world, it's, mm. it's pretty short. Um, mm -hmm. the, the Greece tended to, uh, they, they emerged from it a little bit more quickly. Uh, and the economy recovered more quickly and they entered the classical period more quickly. And then we talk here about, you know, the Parthenon, Greek drama, philosophers, Socrates, all those. So, and then we'll, we'll be talking about that in subsequent sessions. Um, the Persian Empire, which is uh, probably, probably, yeah, I would say next to Greece, they they were that area of the world. And this this encompasses the Middle East. They were uh, you know, a nomadic people initially, um, but Cyrus the Great around 550 BC began mobilizing armies and unifying the Middle Eastern region. Uh, and essentially established the, uh, um, let, me, let me get this out of the way here and I'll just, we'll get a map. I believe I have one right here. There we go. The Achaemenid Empire. Um, this is the first Persian Empire and it was established by Cyrus the Great who essentially consolidated control and he himself um, brought a revolutionary new form of control and government to the region uh, where he had regional, basically regional governors that would take control of certain areas and in, in, in having these regional governors uh, in control of these conquered areas, uh, made the Persian empire very vast and very consolidated in a time that was otherwise, you know, when we're talking about the iron age, everything was fragmented and all these different groups are fighting each other. He consolidated this entire region into, into the Persian empire. And, um, we'll get more into the exact time frame, but the point being is that the, uh, the Persian Empire um, was also another major power. But what's different about them is they were nomadic people that were uh, proficient at riding horseback and using bows, uh, whereas the uh, Greeks 
um, were not nomads. They were more settled and they were more agrarian people. Uh, and obviously there's a lot of history between these two cultures and these two empires eventually conflicting with one another. And there's a lot of major battles that we'll talk about in the future. And then we have uh, the Iron Age in Europe, which uh, when I get to the regional timeline, you'll see it varies pretty dramatically depending on the different region of Europe. Uh, but I think the most famous uh, culture that comes from the Iron Age Europe is the Celts. And the Celts actually, they, they're not, they're not uh, an indigenous people from Britannia. Um, they actually migrated from other parts of Europe and eventually made their way across the channel and uh -huh. became uh, uh, inhabited um, what would eventually become, you know, the United Kingdom. Um, they um, were very prolific uh, in Britain, Ireland, France, and Spain, as this says, and they eventually, um, through migration and time, and as, as we see people exiting the Iron Age, um, they, they laid a foundation for civilizations that would later come in contact with a Roman Empire and fight the Roman Empire. So from, from Celtic migrations, we eventually see um, the rise of, you know, the Gauls, um, and we see the rise of other um, adjacent entities that Rome would eventually have to face and fight. I'm just going to plug in my plug in my laptop. So mm -hmm. uh, the Celts later became like Germany or not? Well, um, I think if we're if we're looking at the German region, uh, it's fair to say that the Germanic people, the Teutonic people, are mm -hmm. what ethnically we would refer to as Germans today. Mm -hmm. but, but the Celts certainly played a part in the formation of that, that people and that identity because they, they did migrate through those areas and they mm -hmm. did come in contact with those people. Okay. Mm -hmm. When but, did Germanic tribes or Germanic people start to exist? Like, well, to um, <laughs> the migrations, I mean, if we look here, I was going to pull up these maps when we talk about geography. And since you have a question about that, we can go here. So this is two interesting maps to show back to back. Let's get up here. Hold on. Oh, we don't. There we go. Okay. Let's see if I can get any more closer on this. Zoom in and run on Europe. Do you have a question about that? Okay. So here is 1000 BC. And remember that the Bronze Age collapse occurred uh, 12th century BC. So this is about 200 years or so after the Bronze Age collapse. So we're, we're in the Iron Age at this point. And then this is... 500 BC, so 500 years later. So we're looking at a difference of 500 years. Now, if we look at 1000 BC, we see this whole area of Europe, um, basically referred to as the Urnfield cultures. And it's an archeological term from a, a, lot, a lot of these because we're, we're talking about an area that's uh, preceding uh, the historical record. A lot of it's based on archeological evidence. So these are archeological terms. But the Urnfield cultures are this, it's this migratory people that had moved away from the coast because of the Bronze Age collapse and because of the collapse of trade networks um, after you know the 12th century BC. And these cultures began intermingling with one another as they moved away from the coast and they were moving up. And then there were also people there that, that migrated to the area during earlier periods during the Bronze Age, but they were <clears throat> essentially hunters and gatherers because remember during, during the Bronze Age, the sophisticated cultures were based essentially around the Mediterranean and the Middle East. Everyone else, that lived in Europe was essentially in a backwater. So the few people that did migrate to Europe during the Bronze Age were essentially hunters and gatherers. And then around this period, around 1000 BC, we see these cultures that were that had been a little more sophisticated, that were living around the Mediterranean basin, uh, that were living around the Middle East, that began that began migrating. So the the Celts and the people that mi migrated from here came from uh, southeastern portions of Europe, and they migrated to Central Europe and Northern Europe forming their own field cultures. And mm. the Teutonic cultures are the people that had migrated there a bit earlier during the Bronze Age, the hunter-gatherers, and these would, would, would later form your Scandinavian and Germanic people. Uh, so that's where you that's where you get um, the intermingling between the Urnfield cultures and the Teutonic cultures. Mm -hmm. Right in between that, of course, is what we see as modern-day Germany. So that, mm -hmm. that's where your Germanic tribes um, okay. came from, those, the intermingling of those two cultures. And if we look here 500 years later, uh, we see that these people over the course of five centuries began to settle. And in the north, you have your Nordic, your Scandinavian cultures. And then in the center of Europe, we see that the Celts had have begun settling down and establishing their own areas. And some of them crossed the channel to uh, Britain. And you have your uh, Gaelic Celts 
Um, and then you also have other cultures that had um, that that break off and become their their own different um, their uniquely owned cultures. And then you have people that live further north that had been there previously uh, due, due to earlier migrations. Um, I believe that was the Picts. So there's this interesting, it, it's again, it's this, this huge intermingling over centuries, these massive migrations, cultures coming in contact with one another, often fighting one another in bloody battles, uh, sometimes intermingling and becoming friendly with one another and giving rise to these, these entirely new cultures um, and regional areas. Mm-hmm. But, so that I, I, does that answer your question with the Germanic people? Yep. Yeah, because if we if we go forward another 500 years, if I had a, uh, a which we will talk about in, in the next session, but as we see Rome really the Roman Empire really enter the, the stage, and and just prior to that Caesar and the Roman Republic, uh, these Celtic people that's when that's when we begin to see Gaul, and we see the emergence of what would become uh, modern day France and Germany. Um, but of course, there's many year interceding years uh, and, and conflict with the Roman Empire before that occurs. Uh, and going back to our sheet here, so that that's a story that that is very briefly, very very briefly, the story of the Celts. I I just found it interesting that they uh, the first time I learned that that they they migrated uh, from other parts of Europe over to Britain. Uh, I always thought they were just like an indigenous people that you know had found Britain at a much much earlier period in history. Mm-hmm. Um, but they they migrated after the Bronze Age, I did not mm-hmm. know, originally. Yeah, I, best time I'm hearing that as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd always thought just like, oh, Celts, aren't they some people who were in like Ireland or something like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and well, and, and some of the interesting features that uh, I would love to see one day personally, get a chance to go there, but um, the features that distinguish Celtic culture, uh, archaeological features, they were very much into building mounds. They used uh, fortress mounds for uh, to increase their defensive fortifications. Basically, just these large earthen mounds where they could, you know, have people on guard, or they could use them uh, as uh, choke points to stop invading forces. And then they also uh, had they they adhered to pag- pagan worship, and they they worshipped uh, nature and spirits, and they buried their dead in mounds as well, which is a distinct feature of their culture. So there's a lot of mound work involved. They're very closely associated with with Earth, of course. Um, the bog bodies; um, these were they're, they're archaeological find uh, in the, where Celtic tribes had inhabited parts of Britain. Uh, the bog bodies were basically corpses that uh, that were well preserved because they've been thrown in peat bogs. And there's a lot of different academic opinions surrounding why they found all that why they find all these bodies from time to time in these peat bogs some think that they were um sacrifices to the gods other things uh, other people think that they were just uh the, the deaths and the bodies were a result of conflict and war um but it is something that's very distinct to the period that for whatever reason they would take the dead uh and they would purposely instead of just the, the un- unwanted dead not 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 the loved ones that they they buried in mounds but um they would throw them in these bogs into the water. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's the history channels, uh, very brief look at it. And, and, and I, the reason I, the reason I use the history channel article is because, um, it's just to illustrate what, what a brief transitory period this was in history. The iron age was not a very vast period of time. Um, and they basically summed it up in this very, very short article. I mean, you uh-huh. know, I think it's, you know, this is pretty much it. You know, it's one page. So there you go. So is everyone having, was it because like everyone had swords and everyone was like, oh, everyone was really tense and stuff and no one could get like a huge dominating empire or what, what was going on? Why was it so dull? Well, it was, it, it, it was a combination of all those things. And it, it's because the, the, the uh, internecine conflict, um, everyone just constantly fighting one another. The, the, the real interesting point is when we look at when these cultures exited the Iron Age. And again, like we talked about before, it's a bit confusing because you think, oh, well, they exited the Iron Age. What happened? What was, what was the next type of technology they discovered? It wasn't so much the, the technology. It was, it was really the rise of intellectualism and the rise of sophisticated governments. Oh, okay. Which, which eventually gave rise to empires, you know, such as the Persian Empire and right, right. classic Greece and everything like that. And as 
as these as these intellectuals and these new forms of government and these these empires came to rise, they of course came in contact with other cultures which were not necessarily sophisticated. So that's that's when you you know you have empire versus barbarian, and these barbarians are people that you know don't have the written word and they don't have sophisticated forms of government. Therefore, they can't consolidate control and they can't uh, yeah, they can't right. they can't establish an empire on their own. But eventually, what we see happen is, uh, and it's the course of development for every empire in human history. Empires, they, they start small and they expand, they expand, they expand. They, they get this tremendous amount of power and influence and they influence the people around them. And then eventually they can't sustain themselves any longer. And due to internal strife and turmoil and uh, exterior forces and migrations and these barbarians from the steppes and the plains, um, we see how the empires collapse. So at, for every, every empire that we examine throughout the course of history, uh, there's, there's that, uh, you, can, you can chart that same path. There's a there's a, a definitive beginning where uh, a person or an oligarchy or an influential group of people establish the empire, and they do so through the consolidation, the centralization of power and control, and they they do it with a sophisticated form of government, uh, and then eventually it it fizzles out to the point mm -hmm. where they, they can't sustain it any longer. Mm -hmm. So um, I think as we go through the regional timeline, it will it will probably help you understand it a bit more. And I'll pull it up now so we can. Mm -hmm. So here we see, I, I broke this down. I won't zoom in on a little bit, so it's easier to read. Mm -hmm. Here's our regional timeline. Now, when we talk about the ancient Near East, <clears throat> we're talking about Anatolia, uh, the Persians, the Hittites, the, the fall of the Hittite Empire, the formation of mm -hmm. the, let me fast forward this here. So this is when each of these regions had Iron Age. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, we see that this area in the Near East, they entered the Iron Age at 1200 BC during the late Bronze Age collapse. And they exited the Bronze Age around 550 BC. And that marks the time of the for for formation of the Persian Empire with Cyrus the Great. And um, Cyrus the Great, I have to read up a bit on the Persian Empire, but um, if I remember correctly, the Achaemenid Empire, which was the first Persian Empire, um, he uh, developed uh, what he called uh, 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 satraps, satrapies. Uh, satraps were regional governors, and the satrapies, I believe, were the, the regions that they controlled. So it was basically like uh, provinces, I suppose you could say. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, government had just been very centralized. And it was, you know, uh, in, the, in the Bronze Age, they, they started to kind of catch on to the idea that in order to consolidate control, you needed a, a bureaucracy and a large administration. And we saw those developments in Mesopotamia and Egypt. But after the Bronze Age collapse, it was basically these war chiefs and warlords running willy nilly across the landscape, just trying to seize control. Cyrus was the one who, when the Hittite Empire fell and the, the parts of Anatolia and what is modern day Turkey and the Middle East, when that was all in complete chaos, he was the one that brought order to that chaos by subjugating all the people around him. And instead of instead of just murdering his subjects or uh, enslaving them or conscripting them, he gave these regional people. Uh, I don't want to use the word citizenship because it, it wasn't at it wasn't at that point it wasn't exactly citizenship yet it wasn't as sophisticated as that but <clears throat> he gave them a sense of worth and a sense of control over their own destinies and he made them regional governors so instead of just subjugating people he absorbed them and assimilated them into his empire and and centralized them that then that's that's why we see during the ancient Near East, that's that's why they exit the Iron Age because of this sophistication. They're still using steel and iron weapons, but uh -huh. they now have a new form of government and an empire. Mm -hmm. And so, as we go through these, it's easy to see these common themes that allowed civilizations to exit the yes. Iron Age. Therefore, you can reason why civilizations were unable, why they were why, unable to exit, why the why it was dark because there was an absence of these developments that allowed them to exit. Right? Yes, exactly, and. Yeah. And that, and that's why, um, that's why during this period, um, I, I think the last tab I have, let me here, let me, I want to double check this. Yeah, the last tab. Yes, I do have that. Okay, we'll, we'll get that in a second. But I, I do have a brief look at some of the literature in the period, but it's, it's, it's ex exceedingly rare. Uh, there's, there's not, um, with it, with the exception of a few different cultures, um, what would become uh, the Indus, Indus Valley and Vedic cultures, and uh, China. Um, there's really not many great literary works during this period because it's a dark age. Mm 
Um, and then Aege the Aegean area, uh, and we're specifically talking about what was Mycenaean Greece, uh, the Greek Dark Ages and Archaic Greece. They entered the, the Iron Age right after the late Bronze Age collapse around 1190. And they exit uh, a little earlier than the ancient Near East. They exit around 700 BC. And that's where we see the, the founding of the Greek city-states and classical Greece. Mm -hmm. And eventually these two empires, Persian Empire and uh, Greece, um, Greece fought, fought uh, Athens and Sparta fought each other at length during the Peloponnesian Wars uh, in classical times. And then, of course, they went on to fight uh, the Persian Empire as well. So um, lots of lots of conflict there. Uh, Italy, uh, of course, the early Roman Republic. Uh, we'll go right here. And when we look at the Italian peninsula or Italy itself um, in 500 BC, which is what this map is showing, there's uh, the Greek city-states are over here in the corner. And they that's the formation of the early Greek city-states. Um, they have colonies on the southern fringes of Italy and Sicily and uh, different areas in that region, Syracuse. And... Um, the Etruscans live in what is uh, what is northern Italy, uh, more towards what would become Rome. And the there's a there's a creation mythology behind the Roman Empire, which I'll, I'll get into in a later uh, a later webinar when we focus on Rome. But essentially, the the people that migrated to this area uh, that had been part of the Greek tradition um, took over, uh, basically subjugated the Etruscans. They, they took over this ancient culture called the Etruscans and they, they gathered certain things from them. They took the bits and pieces that they liked. Uh, they, they retained some of their own cultural values, but around 500 BC is when we see the first, the first emergence of Roman Kings. And um, several hundred years after that, it leads to the Roman Republic. And a couple hundred years after that, we see the rise of the Roman empire. So um, when we look at our regional timeline, if I can get back to it, um, Italy uh, enters or exits the, uh, the the Romans exit the the Dark Ages around the same time as the Greeks. So we have these two cultures in the Mediterranean area that are evolving at the same time: the Greeks and then the Romans. And that's why um, the that's why that area became so sophisticated and exited the Iron Age sooner because they had a lot of philosophers and um, more sophisticated government and things of that nature. Now, the, the Balkans, on the other hand, what excluding Greece, of course, for when we're talking about like uh, Macedonia and areas like that, they exited the Iron Age a bit later because compared to Greece proper, they were they were a bit of a backwater. They didn't necessarily have um, the sophisticated forms of government and they were easily subjugated by their their southern Greek neighbors. Uh, Eastern Europe, the uh, nomadic cultures in Ukraine and Russia, the land of Rus. Um, they exited the Iron Age around 650 BC. Um, they also, and if you notice here, this is where we see a distinction. Eastern Europe, they, they entered the Iron Age at a bit uh, later time. They entered at 900 BC. And that's, again, because as we go further east, we see cultures uh, entering the Iron Age at a later period and exiting the Iron Ages at a different period because they were more insulated. They were further away from this late Bronze Age collapse geographically. Mm -hmm. Western and Central Europe, uh, the Proto-Celts uh, and Gauls, uh, their Iron Age was from 800 to 50 BC. And that's where we really, when we talk about the Gauls, that's, that's the classic vision in, uh, of, of barbarians. When we, when we talk about uh, Rome versus the barbarian Gauls and the, the Celts and you know, the savage berserkers fighting this well-organized army of uh, you know, legionnaires, mm -hmm. uh, that's, they were in the Iron Age a bit longer than uh, uh, Rome was. Hmm. Um, Great Britain, um, Britannia, they were uh, entered the Iron Age and exited the Iron Age at later periods in history, 800 to 100, uh, 800 BC to 180. And we see a lot of um, uh, regional conflicts in this area. And then uh, eventually when Rome decides to extend their influence to Britannia, there's conflicts there as well. Um, Vikings in uh, the Scandinavian culture in Northern Europe, um, they, uh, they, the, the, the Scandinavians and, uh, Nordic cultures entered 
the Iron Age at a later period, 500 BC, and then they exited mm -hmm. at a much later period, 880. They didn't technically exit the Iron Age until the emergence of Vikings, because in uh, along with the Vikings came a lot of uh, a lot of writings. Um, they had their own very rich um, sagas, Viking sagas mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. detailed the exploits. So when when the Vikings first appear in Scandinavian culture, we see the rise of Jarls and kings. And again, we see this sophisticated form of government, a, a more sophisticated form of government. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's when they uh, exited the Iron Age and began the, the Viking Age. Uh, mm -hmm. I put and, and, and again, when we talk about regional differences, that's why I, I mentioned Charlemagne here. I, I don't know how familiar you are with Charlemagne, but he uh, he would become king of what was later uh frankia the king of the franks and oh, okay. which was later parts of france and germany but at the same time the vikings were exiting the iron age and they actually got a hold of their own form of government with jarls and stuff like that and they were a bit more sophisticated at that same time charlemagne was crowned holy roman emperor so he was crowned basically by, by the Catholic Church as a Holy Roman Emperor, which was a huge leap forward for parts of Europe. And it, it showed how it just shows you how much more advanced that part of Europe was ahead of um, the Vikings. Yeah, wow. <laughs> so this is 880. This is much further than you know, this, uh, well, well past what we're, what we're talking about in relation to some other parts of the world. But it, you can just see how these different regions, although they're really close on a map. I mean, when you look at it, you're like, well. You know, if we look at the map here, you know, th this area that would later become uh, France and Germany, they they exited the Iron Age much sooner than these cultures up here, these Nordic cultures. And then when this when these Nordic cultures did exit the Iron Age and they became a bit more sophisticated and, and they had uh, a little better technology and a more elaborate trade system, what do they do? Well, they start exploring and then they start invading. And then you see the, the Viking raids and the turmoil it causes in Europe. So mm. uh, China. Actually, I skipped South Asia. So South Asia uh, is the Vedic period and resettlement and the rise of pre-Hinduism. We haven't really um, hit a lot on uh, South Asia, but there there is a really interesting story there, especially in regards to religion and Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, in the Vedic period, um, there, there are these scriptures that are written by the cultures that inhabit the area during the time. They're really the first true attempts at uh, putting pen to paper and writing down you know, uh, a sophisticated form of religion and a creation mythology, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to just pagan worship and, you know, maybe, maybe, or, uh, you know, worshiping like a, a pantheon of gods. So, mm -hmm. um, that's something we could talk about if you're interested in particular, oh, yeah. that would be a whole session in itself. Um, and they entered the bronze age or I'm sorry, they entered the iron age right at the late bronze age collapse around 1200 BC because of their, their proximity to, to the ocean, to the Indian ocean. And the fact that they were uh, a, a very significant part of the trade network that suffered during the late Bronze Age collapse. And then they exited the Iron Age around 200 BC. Hmm. And then we have uh, other parts of Asia, uh, China. Um, we're talking about this is where we see the transition between um, the uh, Bronze Age China to Iron Age China, which is also right around the time we go to the spring and autumn period in the Warring States period. Mm -hmm. And I have a map for that as well. I can get rid of this. So we have the Warring States period. I'll zoom out a little bit. And this is around 260 BC. And we see the different states here. The uh, Zhou capital area uh, is there in gray in the middle. But we see all these emerging states, and these are these are all the fractured states of China that begin to develop uh, as the Eastern and Western Zhou empires. Where we talked about the transition earlier, where um, you know China was basically founded on the, the first empires and first dynasties were really founded upon um, uh, constant warfare and movement and the envelopment of neighboring tribes. And then once these once these early states were established, um, as soon as someone uh, was removed from the throne, there was this really hot, you know, hot, hotly held competition for power. Right. Um, so we we see we see the emergence of all, all these states or the warring state period, which, again, we'll, we'll talk about in greater detail. But when we look at it on the timeline, 
we see that uh, China was a bit more insulated from the collapse. So their their Iron Age period is 500 to 200 BC. But the interesting thing about China is it wasn't necessarily uh, a dark age period for China because they were still producing a lot of um, wonderful writing and they still had uh, they were working on developing their civic society. So China doesn't China's one of China and South Asia uh, and Southeast Asia they don't really fall very neatly into this, this iron age, uh, one of these, these three major periods. It's, it's more of a, uh, it's a very Western centric uh, view of history. So, um, but this is roughly when we look at China's iron age, 500, uh-huh. 200. Uh, Korea, um, they have their own three kingdoms period. Uh, this is, this is the era, the era right before that, the proto three kingdoms period, 300 BC to 380. Uh, Japan has the uh, Yayoi period, which, I believe gets its name from a type of pottery that archaeologists discovered that dates back to this period. Um, it's a very specific type of pottery, the Yoyoi pottery, um, but 100 BC to 380 for them. And then Sub-Saharan Africa and Sudan Africa. Uh, again, that's an area that it doesn't necessarily fall into this Western centric view of history very neatly <clears throat> because they parts of Africa discovered bronze working and iron working simultaneously and other parts didn't discover it altogether for a much later time. It had to be introduced to them. So that you, you see this really large period, 1000 BC to 480. I mean, that's, that's dramatic. Uh, it just really, each of the regions in Africa have to be looked at in their own regard. Some were obviously more sophisticated than others. Uh, and mm-hmm. if, um, and then the, the Americas, of course. I didn't. I didn't include the Americas because they didn't have an Iron Age. They never discovered iron working. Had they <clears throat> had the cultures there discovered iron and steel working, then you know when when the old world met the new during the age of discovery, it may, may have went quite differently. Never discovered iron working, hey? No, no. Ah. They did have metal working, different type of metal working, but it was mostly cold metal working, um, and working with precious metals. So they did have. There is evidence of copper working, but mostly it involves uh, gold. And then they they also had uh, their weapons were still, I mean, they were, they were still using Stone Age weapons, uh, Neolithic weapons when when Europeans first visited. I mean, they were using obsidian knives, oh. which were made out of. Well, they didn't have bronze. They had bronze, but they used it more for uh, ornate. Uh, well, they had they had uh, no, but they didn't have alloys. They had they they just used. They just use basic metals. They didn't combine them. So they, they, okay. they had copper. Uh, they would have like copper trinkets. They'd have a lot of gold, oh, ton, tons of gold. But it was just stuff that they could find on the surface. They didn't have, you know, any sort of like mining technology. They didn't have, they didn't know how to smelt metals and combine uh, or combine different metals into different alloys to make the superior, you know, product. So that is why um, Europe is so, just so domineering during that period. Have you seen the movie Apocalyptica? No yes. Gibson? Mm-hmm. Well, I shouldn't. I was gonna say, you know, the ending, but I don't want to. I don't want to ruin it on <laughs> anyone yeah. watching. So the, mm-hmm. I'll just take it back. Doesn't matter. Anyway, yeah, it's great. It's a great movie. The ending right, makes you kind of go. Huh. <laughs> yeah, it's very entertaining. Um, okay, and then just very quickly, uh, we we talked about a lot of this, but I'm just gonna go over. These are some important observations about the period. Mm-hmm. Marked by ceaseless warfare, uh, we see the rise and fall of proto empires and. I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not so full of myself to think that I coined that term proto empires. I'm sure I've read it somewhere else before I've seen it, but um, the irony, I, I, I use the term proto empire because during this, this period that affects different regions differently, we don't see true empires. We see the rise of some of these different, you know, regions where these, there's a bit of consolidated control, but then they kind of fizzle and peter out. We don't really see the rise of empire until Cyrus the Great you know, founds the first Persian Empire in 550 BC. And so what Greece, does the suffix proto refer to, sorry? Proto means... Um, prefix, I mean, prefix. Yeah, uh, it, like like prototype, it means... Uh, oh, yeah, that's right. The, the, the forerunner of something. Yep. So, yeah, so I, and I use, that's why I use the term proto-empire, because they're not empires in the strictest sense of the term. Uh, right. But there are certain groups that do do rise to a bit of power during the Iron Age. You know, we, we see that in some of the maps here. Um, uh-huh. We have in this area, uh, in in the Middle East, the Near East down here, we have. Let's see if I can move this over. 
you know, where we, where we did, where we, where we did at one point in time have, and, you know, in Anatolia, uh, where we had the, the Hittites, you see here, the Neo Hittites, and we have the Phoenicians and we have Israel and we have the Armenian, uh, Ar Ar Armenian kingdoms, uh, Assyria, uh, or uh, some of these things I can't pronounce because they've just been lost to history, but, um, some of them are, are more recognizable, Babylon, things of that nature, but, at this point in history, these are these are no longer empires. The, the closest thing we have to an empire is Egypt, which is in its 21st dynasty during this time period. Um, so, you know, that's 1000 BC. Now, 500 BC, right smack dab in the middle of the Iron Age for a lot of these areas. You know, you can see the change here. We have the, uh, the Thracians, uh, Illyrians, uh, and then the Greek city states. And over here, what was you know, a very fragmented area in 1000 BC with the emergence of Cyrus the Great, we see this massive uh, Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. And that's where we really, that's where they properly exit the Iron Age. It's this mm -hmm. massive, far reaching empire. So that's why I use the term proto empire. So the um, Persian Empire was one of the first huge empires. Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe right. the first. Uh, I, think, I think it's fair to say that when we use the term empire, in the strictest sense of the term, you know, uh, uh, this massive, this massive uh, state that that exerts its influence and control over a large area and, and assimilates other peoples. Yeah, uh, Persian Empire was the first. Mm, interesting. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. And this period was also it was the foundation for modern warfare and weapons. Uh, and you know, when we're talking about metal metalworking in regards to iron and steel. The, the technology that they begin using here, specifically with steel work, and when, we start, when they start working with high carbon steel and they, they develop ways to, to heat it to uh, heat it and work with it to make a superior product. Just gonna the weapons it. that, okay. The, the weapons, okay. The weapons they introduce uh, aren't changed for another two millennia. Basically, you know, everyone's still using uh, swords and mm -hmm. spears, uh, and to an extent uh, shields and then armor uh, that are made out of steel. And it's only with the introduction of gunpowder and, um, you know, cannon that we really see another major innovation, the, the, the quote unquote gunpowder revolution. Uh, um, conscription is also uh, begins to um, gain more footing at this point. Um, we don't see mass national conscription like we do during the Napoleonic era, because at this point, obviously, nations don't exist yet. But mm -hmm. um, because iron is available to many more uh, it's because it's this it, uh, it has a greater uh, there. There's more of an abundance of iron. Uh, we see the iron, that these armies are outfitted with all sorts of iron weapons, and of course the the these um, regions that do have standing armies, such as Egypt, have to conscript soldiers to defend themselves from outside influences. Uh, and um, the um, with greater conscription and larger armies came the rise of the professional military establishment, standing armies, and the emergence of what Ian would, would enjoy, mercenaries. Uh, so um, we'll be talking, and, and we don't so much, I mean, there are mercenaries during this period. They do run around and they, they are soldiers for hire, but um, it's really during the classic antiquity when we really see uh, mercenaries in their own right. And they, they become a staple of uh, Western culture and Western warfare. Um, probably until you know the 17th century uh and even after that mercenaries are they, they still play a part in it uh and then the more developments the more important military developments since this is a military history uh, overview of iron age were uh changes in the size of army uh logistics and transport um because we see refinements in uh war chariots uh the spoked wheel uh different uh technology that allows and and ships as well we see uh, more sophisticated ships that allow greater uh, uh, uh greater uh, um, more more items be moved through shipping uh, uh which leads to more sophisticated trade which also leads to troops being able to be transported longer distances across the seas um, strategic and tactical mobility, siege craft and artillery that emerges as well. Uh, staff organization, which we talk about staff officers and, and military training, uh, mm. all this stuff it begins to, it begins to take hold during the iron age. Mm -hmm. So that is our, that is our transit transition period as referred to the iron age. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll close that. And then we'll go back to our maps real quick. I think we covered all of our maps. I'm not sure I didn't. Oh, yes. So this is the one note I wanted to end on. 
because I'm not a huge fan of Wikipedia because Wikipedia, you know, anyone can make an entry on it and it's not really an academic, I don't consider it an academic resource, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, Wikipedia does have this interesting um, entry on Iron Age literature. And as you can see here, um, let me zoom in on this a bit. We see these Iron Age texts from, uh, you know, 1200, 1100 BC, approximate dates of the book, uh, the Rig, Rig Vedas, uh, one through 10. Those are the religious texts that first take hold there. Uh, Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit, which is one of the more ancient written languages, Vedic Sanskrit, is used in different areas of uh, what is modern day India. Um, in Egypt, there's the story of uh, Winanum, uh, Winanumun, which I'm not familiar with. Uh, Akkadian culture makes a few texts. Um, Chinese culture in particular, because like I said, they don't, they don't neatly fall into this Iron Age discussion. They're still making incredible advancements during the period, uh, everything from poetry to war and tactics and things of that nature. So they're, they're moving along really well. Um, and then the, we also see the Jawas and portions of the Torah uh, being created during this period. The Epic of Era, which is an Akkadian epic uh, about one of their, their petty gods and people dealing with the gods. Mm. So, um, but when you look at this list of uh, ancient works, ancient literary works compared to um, other periods in history, I mean, like some of these periods, like the sixth century BC, like one century will eclipse the entire Iron Age. And then if you look at, you know, like the late Bronze Age, this is all from the Bronze Age right here. Uh -huh, know, uh -huh. These these works, yeah, I mean, right, right, right. This, this predates the Iron Age. That's again, that's why we call it a dark period. It's right. not that it's not that there was a complete absence of the written word and intellectualism, but far and wide, it was very dark and it was, it was a very troubling time. Right, just too much, uh, too much warfare to keep keep him busy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that I believe concludes everything we need to discuss. So, um, yeah, this was just again, this is more of a um, a foundation uh, lecture, and it was just to give you an idea of the Iron Age and um, the, the transitory qualities of the Iron Age and the significance of, the, of how, I think it really puts in perspective how sophisticated the, the Bronze Age societies were uh, compared to Iron Age societies. And what we'll be able to look at next, I think is, um, well, it's up to you, uh, but I was thinking a good place to start would be the Persian Empire um, with Cyrus. And then we could, we could talk about some of the cultures around the Mediterranean. And we could work. Oh our way yeah. In. Well, if we could talk about how how that guy established an mm -hmm. empire. Yeah, Cyrus the Great is a very, um, a very uh, entertaining and interesting historic figure to read yeah. about. His his story oh, is very, great. very good. And then we can uh, work our way back east, and we can go back to China as well, because <clears throat> this is um, as we move forward, th th that's where we see a lot of the works that I know you and Ian are interested in, such as Sun Tzu and uh, a lot of the uh, works concerning tactics and strategy proper. Um, so yeah, I think we could probably pick up with the Persian Empire next, which yeah. is... I think that's a great choice. Yeah, that's military history, and it's, and it's the, the golden age of military history, in my opinion. I, I, I very really? much enjoy reading about that period, yeah. Wow. There, there's, there's obviously other periods to talk about, and um, scholars specialize in different areas, but I particularly enjoy the... Uh, era of classic antiquity and the interactions between the Near East and Western yeah. cultures and stuff like that, because it, it really, it sets the precedent for, for everything else within uh, Western society and the Western tradition. All right then. So, okay. Well, that was yeah. going to be awesome. I'm going to, um, I'm going to end. Okay. Okay. What have I done?